And now, from the dark corners of the internet, where exploits run wild and packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, the beer flows steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. This episode sponsored by Palo Alto Networks, created as the next generation firewalls, helping you enforce network security policies based on applications, users, and content. Visit them on the web at paloaltonetworks.com. And by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit them on the web at sans.org to learn more. And by Tenable Network Security, the creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Check out the new Nessus Enterprise and Nessus Enterprise Cloud to engage your IT departments in the vulnerability management process today. And finally, by Black Squirrel. Pen test networks from your browser. Exploit the limits of network security through just a browser. Have a custom Chrome exploit in your toolkit? Great. But for the rest of us, there's Black Squirrel. Visit blacksquirrel.io for more information. Now it's time to fire up a packet capture, pour yourself an adult beverage, and give the intern control of your Bitcoin mining farm. Because here's your host. He's a man who doesn't give me enough time to create an intro, even though I tell him I'm not ready. Mr. Paul Asadorian! Welcome, everyone, to this edition of Paul Security Weekly. In the show notes, it says it's a man who loves Phil Collins' music. You need to refresh. Oh. <laughs> I hate Phil Collins' music. Chris was <coughs> in here in the studio earlier in the week, and Phil Collins came on our Pandora, and I'm uh-huh. like, dude, there's not too many rules in the studio. Like, you can, can smoke. You feel it you coming can drink, in the Yeah. <laughs> you can fart. You can burp. Not too many rules here, except <coughs> no Phil Collins and no Bon Jovi. Why no Bon Jovi? I don't, I, I, no you know? Pour your sugar on me. I'm pretty. And Michael Bolton? No, Michael Bolton's okay. Michael apparently. Bolton's okay. What was, what was nope. I forget the movie. The the two Brits there the, the, over dinner. One of them asks the other, "Where do you stand on Michael Bublé on his windpipe?" <laughs> 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 yes, that <coughs> nice. And some announcements. Nice. Uh, check out the SteelCon competition. Enter to win a Security Tube training course. You must write documentation for an open source project. Details can be found in the show notes. Larry is teaching SANS Wireless 617 Ethical Hacking, uh, Wireless Ethical Hacking and Defense coming up in Orlando and Berlin. The dates and the link to register are in the show notes. We've re-uploaded our most popular tech segments and interviews into a YouTube playlist dubbed Security Weekly Reloaded. The link is in the show notes. Uh, We have an all-new YouTube channel, so you can check that out. Please do so. Um, we also have a new SlideShare, slideshare.net forward slash security weekly. We have wow. an archiving presentations there. So lots of fun things. You know, as we enter the end of the year, you'll see a lot of um, changes organizing our content. We've produced an epic amount of content. So we're, uh, Chris is working feverishly to, uh, to get some of that organized for everyone. So that's a lot of fun. We have a fantastic show for you. We've got um, just a sneak preview. Adrian Wade is coming on the show to talk about his Kickstarter project. We've also got Brandon McCann coming on to talk about Fishing Frenzy. And, of course, we've got the always popular stories for this week where we'll talk about all of the security debauchery happening in the world, including probably talking about the new Microsoft Vulnerability <laughs> affecting Kerberos. Hooray! Among other... Ha- Larry is the penetration tester, says hooray. Uh, and he is correct in <laughs> describing yes. that. Yes. Yes. Um, so, oh, and a note on t-shirts. Make sure you check shop.securityweekly.com. I don't, I don't want to officially announce anything because they're not actually in our possession. But hopefully tomorrow we are scheduled to get a shipment of over 1,500 T-shirts wow, in stock. Ju- it is ju- just in time for Christmas. Just you in can, time in for fact, ship your T-shirts. I mean, ship your T-shirts. You <laughs> could ship ship your T-shirts. <laughs> um, I, so I will give uh, people kind of a sneak preview. Uh, if you, Well, I'm going to send the message out on Monday. It might be too late for those listening to this. We are going to run a Black Friday special on T-shirts if they arrive uh, in time. It is the largest T-shirt order we've ever placed There are all new designs and styles. In fact, if you go to shop.securityweekly.com, you can see 
all of the new styles and designs that we have. You can't order them. They're there. Everything's <coughs> entered into inventory and uh, we'll be ready, hopefully, to ship on, on Black Friday. So provided they come in tomorrow and uh, they look okay, we will uh, send out an email to our Security Weekly Insider. You can go to our website, securityweekly.com. Subscribe to the Security Weekly Insider mailing list if you subscribe there. Uh, we're going to send out a Black Friday deal and probably one more deal before the end of the year, especially for our Security Weekly subscribers. So make sure you go check that out, shop.securityweekly.com. It's going to be fun, fun times in the studio because... Uh, 1,500 t-shirts is a lot of boxes, and the pallets don't necessarily fit up the stairs to the <laughs> second floor, <laughs> <laughs> which means uh, we'll have not one but two hand trucks and three people uh, mm -hmm. helping. And no elevator. And no elevator. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get our workout tomorrow, but it's all for a good cause. Yep. We'll have, for the first time ever, smoke naked t-shirts. So, so any new designs yet? There is a new design. In fact, there is the hack naked female cut shirts so we have lady okay. shirts yep um, but the sa same logo but female cut, we have right? uh same logo in pink mm -hmm. with the hack naked mud flap girl and we've got i call mud flap guy he's not really oh. mud flap guy it's it's a naked guy with a cowboy hat on a laptop and it says hack naked for the ladies or oh men. okay yeah. yeah that's that is not obvious from the site that there is a new we will design rectify that situation so yeah when you go to to that Sh you get yeah. You get that. Oh. You get the back of this one in the, yeah, and the front of this one. So it looks the same. But if you go to the lady shirt, yes. it does feature the second design. Yes. But it's not prominent that's, that there that's is That's an old new, new design. And we talked about yeah. uh, having, and we will hopefully have in our possession tomorrow. But I will not open up the store until we have them in stock, obviously. Yep. Um, but I'm told that they will be here so tomorrow. As of right now. There is a new ladies shirt design with the mud flap dude. Guy. Mud flap dude. Mud, mud flap, flap guy. Dude. So make sure you go to the women's hack naked t-shirt and yes. check out the alternate cover design, as it were. Um, because it's not currently obvious. Okay. On to our first interview for the show. Adrian Wade is the director of Bright Things UN Limited, an Internet of Things startup established this year in Bristol, England. Adrian had 20-year career engineering firms like Ericsson and Emerson Electric, where he directed telecom infrastructure business in the Asia-Pacific region. region. In 2008, Adrian set up as an independent consultant, consultant <coughs> even helping telecom operators adopt smart energy systems that reduce carbon footprints and pay for themselves in energy bill reductions. I like those. Adrian believes that everyone needs privacy on the internet occasionally, and it should be easy to have when you need it. Adrian can be found on Twitter at Adrian Cloaked. Adrian, welcome to the show. Good evening, guys. How are you? I'm, I'm well, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Adrian, why don't you start by telling us about uh, your Kickstarter project that you created? Okay. Uh, it, it's uh, uh, been an interesting time. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you guys and uh, everyone out there uh, was watching the news with uh, regard to the Anonabox. Yes, um, absolutely. Uh, a job which, uh, which came up and uh, <laughs> that, that was a pretty bad week for us actually. Uh, we'd started uh, looking at the process of building an Onion Router, um, perhaps uh, I think in February or January. And uh, th this just came from uh, a more or less philosophical discussion, I think, between myself and the engineers, um, including Lars, who is online here now. Uh, and w what I felt was that if there were uh, an easier way for, you know, your average guy in the street to be able to look after his privacy a little bit more carefully uh, when he was online, then he would do so. And, you know, Lars wasn't sure about that. He doesn't know if he agrees with me still. <laughs> but we realized the, the only way to figure out whether or not it was the case was to make one, <laughs> try to get it into mass production. So that, that was the point of our Kickstarter project. But uh, um, we were beaten to launch by a nonobox by a matter of probably weeks. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we, we sat and thought about that pretty hard and decided which way to jump. And we thought, well, no, you know, we, we mean to do this. And so we'll go ahead. And so we, uh, we launched the Kickstarter project anyway. But uh, we feel that because of the sort of crash and burn nature of what happened with the Nonobox initially, it, it sucked a lot of the oxygen, mm. uh, uh, you know, out, out of the uh, potential customer base there. Because I think that people genuinely are quite concerned about a lot of the technical questions that were raised around the, the, the product. Uh, I want to welcome Lars to the show. Lars, welcome to the show. 
Uh, hi. I, I was muted. So Yes. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you for joining us this evening, uh, which is very late uh, your time. Uh, I'm sure. No, I'm actually in Malaysia. It's very, very early. It's very early <laughs> for you. So it's like <laughs> not, uh, well, not quite 9 a.m. It's probably like 7 a.m. for you, right? It's 7 a.m., yes. 7 a.m., yeah. Uh, well, good morning and welcome. Um, Thank you very much. So, uh, Adrian, um, the project, the uh, Anonabox project was criticized, of course, uh, because they did not have their own hardware designs, and that was one of the sticking points for people. So tell us about your hardware design and uh, where it stands today. Well, wh where it uh, uh, came from in the first place is that we looked at uh, quite a number of the pieces of hardware that um, uh, August had shown on his project page there. And w when we investigated them, it didn't seem possible to get all of the libraries that we were going to need to I into the firmware build to actually get the thing to work properly. So that, that's why we'd abandoned them. I think that Lars did have some luck with, with, with one of them, but it was extremely poorly documented. I think the GameStrong device mm -hmm. uh, was very, very, very hard to understand. And so in the end, uh, we, we decided that the best way to do it would be to, to build our own hardware for that. Um, I, I think it's the uh, availability of uh, memory uh, that's the principal driver there. Lars can probably provide some better detail on that. Yeah, Lars, if you could tell us a little bit about the hardware. <coughs> well, I mean, the, the, a lot of those uh, mini routers, they call them 3D routers, I think, mostly. Uh, I mean, they, they suffer from lack of memory. And I, as, as Adrian mentioned before, I, I experimented with this back in January, and I found it, it became obvious quite fast that Tor is not exactly nice on memory. Mm. Uh, so um, it needs a whopping 64 megabyte before it will actually run. That doesn't sound like much, but in a small embedded device, that is actually high end. Uh, most of the cheap routers will only have 32 meg or even 16 meg of memory. Uh, so. We, we, we definitely needed 64 meg and we needed 16 meg of storage. That became obvious quite fast. But mm -hmm. the fact that we already had that module uh, ready in some of our other Internet of Things related uh, projects, uh, we basically had the core of the design ready. All that was needed to do to make a cloak device was basically to put that with an Ethernet device, e Ethernet port uh, on a PCB. That's basically it. Mm. That's all we needed to design. I got you. So there's no, uh, there, it, there's no magic about it. it, it it's just a, 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 a tiny device that have the capacity to run tall. Now, what's the processor architecture on your device? It's a MIPS. Okay. And it's did a, you an Atheros uh, MIPS device. Uh, it, it's comparable with, with the processor-wise, it's comparable with many of the TP-Link. Okay. Routers yep. that are available. And yep. so I'd imagine you're running in OpenWare or derivative from OpenWare? Yeah, that's correct. Mm. We, are, we are forked directly from uh, OpenVRT or OpenWorks. Open <laughs> yeah. I never heard it said that way before. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, cool. Those crazy Americans always crazy Americans. That stuff. That's yeah, right. Yeah. That's Open right. Work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the, our, our source code uh, that that's also contrary to an honor box. We actually released the source code uh, several. Uh, it's been available for a couple of months actually on GitHub. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we're doing is on GitHub. Uh, I think it's uh, GitHub.com <coughs> slash reclaim your privacy. I think that was a very important part of the uh, uh, the process here for us as well, because um, a, a, our part in this is producing the hardware. And uh, there are many, many erudite gentlemen who post to the boards uh, at the Tor project. And we are fully aware that we, we need to encourage expert debate on the substance of the issues that go around a device like this in order to make sure that we get it right. And uh, the, the, the whole point of the open source approach is to uh, facilitate that process, really. And the wireless chipset, what, um, what types of wireless networks can I connect to? Uh, it's 802.11bgn, I would say. There's no A. There's no A or AC, right? No, no. Yeah. And Not in the current chipset. It's BGN. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, 
Now, to power this device, is it just run off of uh, like your USB port? Yeah, correct. That's cool. It looks pretty um, uh, like it would fit easily in your travel bag and uh, very compact as well. What were some of the challenges in, in getting it down to that small of a size? I think one of the uh, uh, challenges that we're facing there is still an argument that the engineers are having in China, and it's to do with uh, where you can actually locate the processor module with respect to the transformers and so on because of magnetic interference. So uh, the, the, the form that you see there, um, we're, we're very clear about that. That's what we want to do, and we hope we can get it that size. Yeah, uh, yeah. It may have to grow a bit depending on what the guy's got to build it says in the end. So mm -hmm, you know, right. we'll keep everybody updated about the progress with that. We, we, we are done nitpicking about one centimeter in depth. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's a whole centimeter. You know? yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. hey, hey, centimeters, that's a, that's a pretty big increase for, for something uh, like that. When you talk about boards, yeah, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and I like the fact that you're being very clear and very upfront about the hardware and being very transparent about the whole process uh, as opposed to some other competing, non, no longer competing projects. I, I said they are actually competing still. They are now on Indiegogo. Oh, yeah. yeah, which is ridiculous. <laughs> but well, well, one there. of the things which came out of that process was that we actually uh, said to August that uh, we'd be very, very happy to take an open debate, uh, you know, about the the reasons for people's objections because I, I, I felt very much that uh, you know that the guy's no fool. He, he does understand roughly what he's doing, but what he wasn't doing was being transparent. Yeah, and. When you're talking about something like this, it, it is extremely important for people to understand how the whole process works and exactly what you're going to get in there. No, nobody's going to have any confidence otherwise. And I, I think there's a real sense of concern that people can end up with a device that they believe is providing them a degree of privacy. Uh, and it isn't. And that's kind of worse than not having the thing in the first place. So, uh, you know, we're not saying that will happen. We just don't know. There's no way to check. Now, um, the design of the case... Was that done on purpose to improve wireless signal, or was that just you wanted to look cool and stealthy, or both? Uh, a a li little bit of the uh, latter, I think, really. We just wanted it to um, uh, you know, fit as neatly as possible around the components that were in there. And uh, yeah, it, it uh, looks a bit stealthy. I think that's the uh, uh, engineer there mm. deciding that would be a, a nice way to make it. But uh, the only thick components are the Ethernet connectors at the front. So that's the reason it looks like that. Yeah, no, it's definitely a, a cool-looking little device for sure. Thanks. <laughs> um, so now the use cases for this, you know, like what what did you define as your audience, and what did you define as some of your driving factors for someone to purchase one of these devices? There, there are a couple of things there, and uh, I, I mean, the way I use the one that I've got here uh, running is it, it's available. Uh, if we're uh, uh, going to use an internet banking service or anything which uh, ha has uh, information related to the uh, transaction that we would like to keep private, then we'll just flip over to that cloaked network and use it for that, for that process. Uh, and, I, and I imagine that that's the way that a lot of people will use this sort of thing. Um, people don't want to be on the Tor network all of the time. Uh, the majority of everyday users also have no desire for anonymity, particularly. Uh, what they're after is privacy. Uh, and so when we're in a situation that, uh, you know, we know increasingly there are all sorts of difficulties with uh, containing information, all sorts of places to attack us and to uh, relieve us of it, uh, it's a very good way to prevent that kind of criminality, basically. So is your connection from this device encrypted into the Tor network, or is it just providing you the anonymity piece uh, when you're browsing websites? It's uh, basically the traffic's encrypted all the way through to the exit node of the mm -hmm. Tor network. So it means that the internet service provider can't see what you're doing either. Um, you know, they're, they're, there's an awful lot of talk about what they do do and what they, information they do sell uh, that's uh, related to you. And obviously that varies from provider to provider and country to country. But uh, the fact of the matter is that with whatever data that's uh, under normal circumstances passing through that ISP, you're trusting every guy who works there. Mm. Uh, and uh, there are situations in which it's clearly unacceptable to do so. I, th I think the biggest concerns that are coming up are to do with um, uh, the, the situation where I, I believe there was a case uh, during the course of last week in the United Kingdom where uh, it was ruled that uh, in certain circumstances it it's possible for uh, uh, the powers that be to intercept communications between lawyers and their clients. Uh, and 
ha they have no fear of comeback. So that, that, that's pretty scary. And if you are a guy like a lawyer who's got a professional obligation mm, uh, uh, to maintain confidentiality, yep. then you know, I, I would suggest that your assurances really aren't worth anything if you can't technically ensure that you've mm -hmm. got that locked down straight. No, so, that's a great use case for it, for sure. You know, uh, and you know, there are other professionals too. I mean, it's uh, everyone, lawyers, doctors, uh, banks particularly concerning for the general public, I think. So uh, uh, the, the, the idea that, uh, that there's a anything other with this de device and just trying to enforce uh, the rights to privacy, which the companies you do business with promise you, uh, people are mistaken. That's what this is about. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about giving ordinary people a way to get the internet to work the way it was supposed to in the first place. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'll, 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 I would uh, kick in here that, uh, I mean, one of the criticisms, one of the things that popped up a lot with Anonobox was people saying, well, why not just install this on a Raspberry Pi? And there is, in fact, uh, I think there's a product available called Onion Pi, which is sort of a, a a toolbox where you get an onion pie and you can load this on it. I mean, I, I would say a product like Cloak, it, it targets people that are not able to do that themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, people who can, in fact, do this on a Raspberry Pi would probably appreciate the extra flexibility that gives them. Uh, so I would definitely say Cloak is meant for, for ordinary people that don't really have the in-depth understanding of how, how it's always working. So I think they're the the uh, what what we're offering to you know people like my mum, for example, uh, is that uh, you know you don't have to suddenly learn to uh, cook your own router. We'll we'll do that for you, at a very reasonable price. Uh, and uh, yeah, what's the price? You know, what's even if you know what you're doing, it'll take you time. Hmm? What's the price point? Uh, we're looking at thirty five sterling, which is about fifty US dollars, roughly. Gotcha. Depending depending on the exchange rate. So, you know, I mean, you can uh, probably pick up a similar spec router for maybe a little bit less than that, but then you're going to have to spend time with it. So, you know, from an economic point of view, we think it's a fair deal. Yeah, so, cool. so looking at the Kickstarter right now, the, uh, the pledge to get one cloak from Kickstarter is... Uh, uh, forty pounds, uh, which is about uh, current exchange rate through Kickstarter is sixty two dollars and seventy cents shipped. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, including the shipping there. Yeah. Yep. It's a pretty decent price. I think I spent twice that on wireless routers today already. <laughs> seriously, ser no, seriously, seriously, I no, you yeah. know, I had a three hundred dollar order from Amazon today, and half of that was <laughs> wireless routers. There you go. There you go. So. But, uh, you know, one of the things which uh, this sort of stuff may uh, encourage is kids who are interested to, uh, you know, get to understand more about what's going on with it, which is good. This technology or this sort of technology seems to have been very much in a dark box to date. And, uh, you know, we think it's uh, it's got a proper place in the world. Very cool. Absolutely. Um how do you overcome some of the challenges when you're using Tor uh, to browse the web of some of the weird things that, that it does, such as when I go to Google and all of a sudden it's in German or something like that? <laughs> um, yes, I mean, uh, the, the, the Google interface is one which is particularly irritating. I, I, I find the most irritating thing about Google is the way that they can get into loops of throwing relentless captures at you um, for, for no apparent reason at all. Uh, I just don't use Google usually. That's uh, my way around it. Use there Duck go. and Go or something instead, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, I, I think that uh, Mark Zuckerberg made a, a very important statement recently with um, a adding the Onion service to Facebook. Um, w w what's really interesting about that is that, uh, you know, I if you care about your privacy, the last place you want to go is Facebook. Right, <laughs> so it's true. Uh, it, it's true. <laughs> it ding, 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 ding. <laughs> no arguments there. <laughs> but 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 the point he's making is that uh, it, it, it's it's a very good point. Well, what what he's saying is that uh, you know I think I think they got a lot of heat last time. Uh, there, there was a whole raft of uh, allegations coming out that they'd been sharing information with the authorities and all this sort of thing. And I, I think they felt that what had happened uh, in many cases was that information had been directly intercepted without asking their permission. And I, I imagine that Mr. Zuckerberg feels that he's a law-abiding businessman. And if the authorities have got a reason uh, to want to have information about one of his users, then they can come to the front door with a warrant from a judge uh, and ask for it. And he will, of course, comply. Um, uh, but what he wants to do is give you the assurance that if you uh, connect to the, the, the Onion service, then 
it's his privacy policy which is holding you, you know, you can hold him to account for that. There's no way that anyone else can intercept that before it gets there. So that, that, that's just a really interesting point, that uh, uh, by using his onion service, you are able to hold him accountable to his own privacy policy, mm -hmm. which you are not able to do if you do it some other way. Um, uh, of course, the other point he was making was that uh, they felt that they'd been a little bit disrespectful of people around the world who uh, you know, wanted to connect to the service and wanted to be anonymous while they were doing it and had been to that point unable to do so for similar reasons to Google. And we, we hope that uh, you know, Google will be taking it on board uh, and will be looking at what they can do to uh, you know, help people out who've uh, got issues with these sorts of things. Very cool. Did you, uh, you so I, was, I just had my credit card out while I was because I was backing a Kickstarter project. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was a little bit distracted. Very much so. appreciated. So how many? <laughs> how many? How many quid did you? Is that right? Did I use that term right? I watched Top Gear and they used the word quid, and I had to look it up. Yeah, 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 yeah they do. Yeah. <laughs> Pants. That term reminds me. My wife and I have this thing. There needs to be Top Gear, not not the U.S. or Australian, but we need the original British Top, top Gear. gear. Yeah. But with like an interpreter. Interpreter. For Americans. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> what the hell are they talking about? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's, 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 it's Google. It's, and it's British. It's not just, it's not just the term. It's the inside jokes, too. Yeah. It's like, it, who is that? I don't know. They, <laughs> they yeah, weren't. They make a joke look, and reference someone's name, and I'm like, They, well, they weren't they, in Harry Potter or Downton Abbey. Yeah. How the hell am I supposed to know who they are? <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> clearly not a nearly <laughs> Anglophiles enough. That's <laughs> true. Uh, Ga Gavin has pledged his help to translate. Help translate. Yeah. Help so, with that. 40 quid to be exact. 40 quid. Because it was 35 quid plus 5 quid shipping. Nice. Yes. Uh, cool. uh, sorry, sorry, gentlemen, I didn't have the 4,000 to be able to make that happen. That, that's, a, that, that's not a problem. We're hoping that someone's going to step up for that. Probably <laughs> <need them> too. <laughs> or, or even the 5,000 at that. But uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I very I, much wanted to pick a phrase to put on the board. But, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that is unfortunately a little rich for my blood at this given point. I understand. But thanks, Larry. You're welcome. <coughs> did uh, anyone else have questions? Um, I thought I did. So... <laughs> You've talked a little bit about the the board design. How long has it actually taken you guys to come up with some of the the hardware design, and um, you know what have sort of been really the pain points for you for for designing your your own hardware for something like this? <coughs> Should I take that, Edwin? Yes, please do, Lars. Please. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, ba ba basically, all these routers are based on Atheros. Um, they they have a standard design or a recommended design on, on how to use their, their chipsets. Uh, unfortunately, that is not uh, public information and you usually have to sign uh, some, some uh, non-disclosure agreements to actually get access to it. Mm. Uh, and that's why we are working with a Chinese chap called Edwin. He, he's part of the project. And he have designed that core module, which is basically the processor and the wireless uh, part of it. So that is already assembled and tested. And what we do is we, we attach the peripherals uh, to that, meaning the Ethernet. And obviously, some, some of the challenges are, I mean, we, we ran into an issue with magnetic interference. Um, Ethernet connectors are isolated uh, elect uh, electrically mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, through a transformer. And apparently, that has some magnetic interference. Uh, that didn't make the processor very happy. Uh, so we have to move that around a little bit. It, it's mostly challenges like that. But as you can see, if you look at some, uh, I, I posted a history um, of, of this product with some of the early prototypes. We have been going through three or four uh, prototypes actually working with this already. So we are, we are quite experienced in, in doing this design. So I wouldn't say there's been that many challenges actually getting that up and running. Excellent. So it's a Theros based as opposed to some of the other routers that we see that are potentially, you know, more consumer grade stuff that is Broadcom based and mm -hmm. drivers are a nightmare to get a hold of and that type of stuff. Well, I, I, I prefer the Theros chipset simply because there is open source uh, sure. available for everything. The drivers are open source. So every time I work with, with embedded devices, I, I usually go for Theros rather than uh, some of the other options available. Mm -hmm. 
That's been a, a lot Rolink of is a particular nightmare. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. That's been very yep. similar to our experiences yep. in the past, Paul. Yep, so that's why I wanted to sort of yep. ask those questions as well. <clears throat> Excellent. Cool. Well, thank you guys for appearing on the show. Are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Oh. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> t- tell us how no it one works, is ever there. ready. No one is no ever ready. No one's ever ready. <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> here's what I'll do. Um, I'll start with you, Adrian, and then I'll ask Lars the same question. And then the next question, I'll ask Lars, and then I'll ask you. So I'll alternate between the two with each question. Okay, sure. Okay, you ready? Sounds like fun. Okay, so Adrian, you're, you're first. Three words to describe yourself. Oh, <laughs> uh, three words to describe myself. I don't normally do that, so that's uh, um, uh, a little bit tricky. But, uh, yeah, I think we're going to have to go with uh, uh, charming, handsome, and resourceful. Mm, I, nice. think, I think that's how we're going to have to do it. Lars, three words <laughs> to describe yourself. Adrian's <laughs> just stole mine. <laughs> 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 oh, there the you word. go. Adrian oh, stole I, mine. I, that's I, three I, words. I <laughs> See, see, I liked I liked Adrian's well, because yeah, yeah. Uh, mine's very similar: charming, handsome, and a liar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Lars, if you uh, were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? It would be a, a, a fly a drone. It would be a drone. Nice. An autonomous drone, so I didn't have to push the button. Mm-hmm. Nice. Adrian, if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? You know, I think I'd just have to be patient and wait for them to drop dead. I don't think I could do that sort of pa- stuff. Patience. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Patience. Wow. <laughs> He's the most effective serial killer of them all. That's right. <laughs> Adrian, if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Uh, the title would be... Um, <clears throat> What would the title be? That's a very good question. I haven't thought about that. Uh, I suppose it would have to be Adrian Wade. <laughs> Lars? Is, oh, Lars, you've had time to think about that one. Come up with a better one. Mm. Fear and loathing in Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one better. Lars, in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the question First, is, I are guess. the Malaysian rules different? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, uh, yeah well, if Ask prefers to go first, if, uh, if, if it's me involved and he's gone first, I'm definitely not going second. So. <laughs> <laughs> first or second, Lars? I said first. Oh, you oh, did? Okay. okay. I, sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, uh, I, sorry. <laughs> and, and Adrian, your... your First, well, unless uh, Lars always, is playing, always, then always to be grabbed first. You know. There you mm-hmm. go. Uh, so, Lars, pick two celebrities to be your parents. Oh, I'm sorry. I think we're on Adrian. Well, whoever wants to answer that, I'll give you both some time to think about. If you were to pick two celebrities to be your parents, who would they be? This is this is the uh, di- the tricky one. Living or dead. Living or Hunter, dead. Honda Honda S. Thompson. <laughs> there you go. We got the dad. <laughs> that would be the dad. Mom, I don't know. Uh, Mom's the hard one. <laughs> yeah, that that that's a bit harder. I can't find one that is. Um, uh, let her be unknown. It's Honda S. Thompson. He'll probably have there fooled around go. a bit. There you <laughs> <go>. <laughs> <laughs> so you got it. An only child there, in, indeed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, y- you know, for me, I think it's uh, uh, probably going to be. Who, who do we want for parents? We want uh, interesting people, don't we? You know, and so I'm thinking that it's going to be. I, I want Socrates for a father. Let's have a, let's have a great philosopher for a father. You know, nice, but uh, nice. you've you got to have somebody who's practical too. So let's let's go for let's, let's go for Marie Curie, a great scientist. There you go. Very. That, nice. That'd be interesting at the dinner table, wouldn't it? <laughs> very. <laughs> Well, Adrian and Lars, thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. You can find a link to their Kickstarter project in the show notes. Thanks again, guys. Cheers. Thanks. Bye-bye. And with that, we'll take a short break and come back with our next interview for the show. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. (laughs) 